name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and God, Amen. Christ is risen. <coughs> As you know, today is um, the third Sunday of the Holy 50 Days of the Resurrection. And if you remember, we were supposed to read the same Gospel of today, the Gospel of the Samaritan woman from John chapter 4, during the Great Lent. Every year we do, but because the, whole, the Feast of the Holy Cross fell on the same day, we didn't read that reading. So, um, just for your information, we read this gospel three times a year, but it's the, uh, the two main times that most people remember are during the fourth Sunday of the Great Lent and the third Sunday of the Holy Fifty, and for different reasons based on the theme of those two um, seasons. And so today we'll focus, um, we'll continue our theme that God has prepared for us uh, this last month, ever since Good Friday, we have been looking at the different Gospels and seeing how the the gift of God is revealed to us based on whatever we are celebrating. So <clears throat> today, the, this concept of gift or grace is very clear in the words of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. So, And he says to the woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So last Sunday, if you remember the gospel, John 6, we were talking about the Lord says, I am the bread of life, right? And this week, he's talking about the living water that he gives to us. And next week, we'll talk about he, him as being the light of the world or granting life to uh, light and life to all of us. <clears throat> so here, the Lord Christ is saying, if you knew the gift of God, he's not only speaking to the spirit of woman, he's speaking to us. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who's speaking to you, you would have asked him. Um, God, in his wisdom, with the Samaritan woman, he comes and he doesn't say, come here, let me give you something. What does he say? What's the first thing he asks of her? He says, give me a drink. So um, the same thing happens with us in our relationship with God. Sometimes, especially when we don't know God that well, we expect that he's going to ask something from us. And of course, he does ask something from us, but what he's asking is very, very small and minimal compared to what he wants to give. But before he gives, he asks. Um, so he asked her for a drink so that he can give her the desire of the living water and the fountain of living water itself from her. And we'll get into this in a minute. And then, same thing with the, the, the people, he asked them for for the five loaves and two fish, so that he could multiply them and feed the multitude. He asked from us 10% of our riches, so he can give us the riches in heaven. He asked from us to fast from the pleasures of life, that we can have the pleasures of eternal life. He asked for us bread and wine, and he gives us his precious body and his holy blood for us. <clears throat> so what does he get in return? He gets our prayers, he gets a little bit of money, which he doesn't need. <laughs> um, and he gets actually us, which for, for us, it doesn't seem like a, a, a big gift, but for him, it is the most precious gift. <clears throat> um, because we are precious in his sight. Um, and if you'll notice, God willing, we'll pray this fraction in, in um, the fraction prayer uh, today. Uh, St. Paul, in his uh, epistle to the Ephesians, he says, after Christ, and this is referring to the, to the Old Testament prophecies, when he ascended, he, as he ascended on high and led captivity captives and gave gifts to men. Um, talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension of the Lord. Um, but in the fraction, and from the teaching of the church, not only does, do we remember that he gives gifts to us, but if you'll notice in the fraction, it says that and he, Christ, gave us as gifts to God the Father. Um, and uh, this is kind of the interchange that we see between what God gives us and what uh, we give him and what the Holy Trinity give to each other. Okay? Um, so... Going back to the concept of the living water, well, what is, uh, see, here, see here, the Lord Christ, with his discussion with the Samaritan woman, he's comparing 
the living water to the water of the well, right? Um, so today we'll talk about three main characteristics of the difference between what the water of this world gives and what the water that the the living water that the living God gives us, so that we may live. <clears throat> the first aspect is that it's fresh. The second is that it's refreshing. The third is that is it, it is unlimited, and the fourth is that it is from Him and comes from us as well, or from within us. I mean, from Him, from within us. Um, so the first point is that the the water of the well, it might have been fresh, um, or the water of this world can be fresh for a time, but if you leave it uh, a few days or or weeks or so it becomes stagnant and it doesn't become fresh anymore. And some people think when it comes to God, the spiritual things might have been interesting the first time they read this or the first time they prayed this or the first time they entered the church or the first time they heard this sermon or whatever. And then after a while, see, they feel that the spiritual life is stagnant. Um, but that's not the... That's not the because of God, it is because of our weakness. Um, because as we prayed in the Lamentations on the twelfth hour of Good Friday, when the Lord was uh, after He was crucified on the cross, and we were preparing for the burial, in Lamentations chapter three, He says, uh, Jeremiah writes, "Though through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, but because His compassions fail not." And then He says, "His compassions are new every morning." And great is the faithfulness of God. So the spiritual person or the deep Christian who has an interaction with the Lord feels that the spiritual life or the relationship with the Lord is new every morning. Um, and just like St. Paul says in Corinthians, he says close to when he was going to be um, martyred, he says, though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. So the spiritual person, even though they might be getting older and weaker and we and um, more sick, say the inward man should be being renewed day by day. Uh, and this is the freshness that the true Christian experiences when they come to the Lord in in fasting, in prayer, in reading the Bible, in um, in in the liturgical mysteries, and so on and so forth. So that's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that it's refreshing, or it brings refreshment to the Christian. Um, just like when you're on a hot day, and you're, like, at this point in time, it was noon, and the Lord had walked uh, for several hours, and he is expecting something uh, to drink. Um so when we walk throughout the desert of this world, we need the Lord to give us coolness and rest and refreshment. As the Lord says in the gospel, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This, this concept of rest is in, in the Greek in, in, uh, terminology, it's almost the same thing as refreshment. So when we think of the paradise, it's a place of refreshment, a, a place of rest. And even in the litanies of the church, we say, for, for the sake, give them coolness, give them grace, give them res refreshment. Um, so although we take rest in the Lord, he also rests with us or rests within us. Um, as St. As Peter writes in his epistle, he says, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, like the people who are confessors or martyrs in the church, um, blessed are you for the spirit of God rests the same word rests upon you. Um, so when we depart from this world, God willing, he will grant us rest. And um, when we suffer for the name of Christ, he grants us rest in this world. He grants us refreshment. Um, <clears throat> so the Christian should find, just like we passed the Holy uh, and Great Lent for 55 days and we toiled and we labored and we fasted and we read and we struggled against sin, and now the church is saying, okay, take a little bit rest in the risen Christ because he is the one who grants us this refreshment. Um, so the spiritual life is not always struggle, struggle, struggle. Yes, we struggle against sin, striving until bloodshed, like St. Paul says. But there are certain times 
in, in our spiritual struggle, they might be a few hours, they might be a few years, where we feel the comfort and the refreshment of, of God. And if we're not feeling it, then maybe it's because we're not feeling that the mercies of God are fresh or they are new every morning. <coughs> so that's the second point. It's, it's not only fresh, but it is refreshing work. It gives us rest and it gives us coolness. The third point is that it is unlimited. The water of this world is very, very limited. Sometimes anything you take that you might think might make you happy or filled, even the bread or the water of this world, it will give you satisfaction of the flesh for a limited period of time, and maybe not even completely. But the refreshment or the fullness that God gives us is unlimited. So he was comparing the water from the well versus the, the living water. What characteristic of the living water that the Lord gives to the Samaritan woman that, that gives this uh, unlimited characteristic? He says, let's see here. Actually, the Lord says it in the Gospel according to St. John chapter 7, where he says, um, at the end of the feast, he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He says, he who believes me, as the scripture has said, for his, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So it's not just a cup or a limited amount of water, but it's a river or a fountain, as other, uh, another place says. <clears throat> and what is this fountain? It's a symbol here of the, the living water that comes from within of the Holy Spirit. And we'll get to it in a minute. But the fact that the Lord doesn't just give us joy in this world, but he gives us unlimited joy. He doesn't just give us peace in our tribulations here. He gives us unlimited peace in the heavenly kingdom. He doesn't just give us victory over our passions or over our sins, but he gives us eternal victory in the heavenly kingdom uh, once and forever when we attain the paradise. So that's the difference between um, the water of this world and the unlimited and, and uh, life-giving water that the Lord gives us uh, through the church. <clears throat> um, the last thing is that it comes from him and from within us, uh, as we see in the beginning and the end of the Bible. So in the beginning of the Bible, where do we see water? It's actually several places, but in the first couple chapters of Genesis, Water is probably mentioned in the first chapter like 10 times. But in the first couple of verses, it says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's the liturgy. <laughs> it's okay. We'll get, we'll get to it actually in, in Colossians. Um, <clears throat> but good, you're paying attention. Um, uh, and then later on in, in the first couple of verses, it says, And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Right? And then it starts describing what the, the city of Eden looked like and how there were four rivers coming out of Eden. Right? <clears throat> so here we see that God is trying to get, get the point across that when we're with God and we're, we're in the paradise or when we're in the presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have these rivers of flowing water that are manifest very clearly, as some fathers explain, in the four Gospels um, of the church. Out of Edom came the four waters, and out of our heart comes the water of the gospel, if we keep the gospel in our hearts. So fast forward to the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 22, where do we see water? Anyone know? I'll read it to you in the first verse of the last chapter of the Bible. It says, and he showed me a, a, a pure river of water of life in heaven. Okay? clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God. So the same idea. From God's throne comes this water. It's not necessarily physical. Maybe it might be, but in heaven, things are not physical like they are in this world. They, they have a spiritual characteristic. And of course, in the Bible, when we read it, it's not um, to describe, it, it's to describe to us a spiritual message. So, so this water is proceeding from the throne of God and from the Lamb. The Lamb here is the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross. And when he died on the cross, what happened? Out of his side came out blood and water for that reason. 
Okay, <clears throat> and that's why in the liturgy we offer wine and water. Okay, and the two are mixed in the cup. Uh, it says, and in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. Okay, um, which bore twelve fruits. We don't have time to explain all of this, but this just shows us that this concept is mentioned not in just the gospel of today, but throughout the the, the Bible, this water that gives life, that gives refreshment, that gives grace, that, that is fresh every day, and that gives, and, and it is unlimited, it comes from Him. <clears throat> uh, and if we're not feeling that so soothing refreshment or grace on a regular basis, hopefully weekly or even daily, then we have to tap into that source. Maybe we're going to the wrong source, maybe we're going to, you know, um, a rock for, for water. Even if you go to the right rock, as the the Israelites did, uh, Moses spoke to the rock, and out of the rock came water. And St. Paul says that rock was Christ. Um, <clears throat> but not only do we find this water in the church, but we find it from within. Because if we're baptized and chrismated in the name of the Holy Trinity, then we have... We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. So that means we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. Um, and as the Lord said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Um, and that's what happened to St. Fotini of today. According to the um, Byzantine tradition in the Orthodox Church, um, this Samaritan woman was called uh, St. Fotini, and she had five sisters and two sons. <clears throat> And after she came to the well, she believed. And after she believed, she received. Just like the Lord said in John 7, if anyone thirsts, let him come, step one, to me and drink. And he who believes in me, step two, um, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And step three, this he spoke concerning the Spirit <clears throat> whom they would receive. So, uh, bless you. So we we come to the Lord, we uh, have these rivers of water that we believe in, and then we receive the Holy Spirit, um, believing in Him. Okay, so she came to the well. She believed in the Savior. And he spoke with her concerning many things, especially the worship of Spirit and Truth. And then she received the power of salvation and the power of witnessing to Christ, because she became a great um, servant at on this time. Not only did she go to the city. <clears throat> and preach Christ and bring the people to Christ. <clears throat> but according to the Byzantine tradition, she went around the world, or at least she went to different parts. <clears throat> so she went to Africa, and she went to Rome later. And <clears throat> after she was baptized on the Feast of Pentecost, <clears throat> sorry, and she, <clears throat> she, she, she and her entourage converted many people to the Lord Christ, so much that the emperor even heard of her. <clears throat> and so he called his soldiers to go and arrest her and bring her to him. But she knew that he was going to come. So according to the, um, the writings, um, she went to him even before the soldiers arrived at her. Um, because uh, And then she began to speak to him of the Lord. They were beaten, they were imprisoned, they were poisoned, even burned, but none of this phased any of them. Um, and so he almost, uh, Nero almost gave up, but then he gave, he brought to him his daughter with, with some of her servants, about a hundred, and they tried to convince her um, uh, by, by showing her the riches of the kingdom. So they brought her like to a gold table and they had them sit on golden chairs and they said, you know, all, all this is yours. Just, uh, just forget what you're doing and what you're speaking about. But through her strong faith and for her love for the Lord, she played the part of the Lord at, that that she received at the at the well. So she received Christ at the well, and she brought Christ to this girl and her servants, and they all converted. And they were um, they wanted to be baptized, and in the gold that they were offering her, they gave to the poor. Of course, this enraged Nero, and it led to the martyrdom of uh, of these saints. <clears throat> but the concept here is when we come into the um, fountain of living water, and we find it from within, then we preach Christ and him crucified and resurrected, and that encourages other people to go to the water as well. Um, 
just like St. Mark, who we commemorate, God willing, tomorrow. Um, he witnessed the Lord, and as the tradition of the Coptic Church states, that one day he was walking with his father from one place to another, and two lions came to to uh, attack them as as they thought. But and his father was afraid. He said, "Go run." He told his son to run away, but his son prayed into the Holy Trinity, and with a strong faith, um, the the animals did not harm them. And because of that situation, his father looked and received and believed and was converted. He wasn't Christian before. But his father was converted because of his son who was faithful and uh, witnessed the power of the resurrection in, in his own life. So may the Lord of grace give us the ability to, number one, to come, number two, to believe, number three, to receive, and um, all of this, we receive the water that is fresh, that is refreshing, that is unlimited, and that comes from God, but from within our heart, as we are all temples of the Holy Spirit. And glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever to the age of